Welcome back to Seriously Sports, the show I do so I'm not doing crystal meth. It also happens to be the only show not drawing penalty flags for unnecessary... <coughs> Damn it, spoke too soon. Week 6 is officially in the books, and what a wild ride it's been. That really goes for the whole season thus far. I mean, honestly. We've entered into the quarterback twilight zone, man. In place of long-standing starters like Drew Brees and Big Ben Roethlisberger... We have instead Teddy Two Gloves Bridgewater making his triumphant return to the status of franchise quarterback and Mason Rudolph, excuse me, Devlin Duck Hodges? Of course, Gardner Minshew in Jacksonville, Ryan Tannehill may have supplanted Marcus Mariota as the Titans starter. Suffice to say, it's been weird. But there are teams that were thought to be guaranteed playoff contenders that aren't quite looking the part. Others appear to be on life support. Which reminds me, damn it. Somebody go check on Miami! Oh, son of a bitch! Clear! Come on, don't you die on me! Clear! I think we're okay. They failed to get the two-point conversion. And with that, we'll enter into the segment I like to call... What the f*** was that? Let's get into it. Starting with the team we were just talking about, the Miami Dolphins. Josh Rosen. What the fuck was that? 15 of 25. So he completed 60% of his passes, but for just 85 yards. No touchdowns, two picks. He's only thrown one touchdown pass so far this year. Now part of the reason for that is that he's constantly under pressure. In this game, he was sacked five times, but that's not his fault. So the line gets one too. What the fuck was that? But seriously, do you know how bad you have to look out there for them to pull you and put Fitz back in there? Pretty fucking bad. So as of this morning, folks are already asking, is the Dolphins evaluation of Josh Rosen over already? And it might be, but it's tough to say. Ultimately though, I'm proud of the Finns for not losing their inside track for that top pick. Because even if they don't select Tua with that pick, it would still be a very lucrative thing to have. Because some other team may be willing to sell the farm for it. Exactly. Props to interim head coach Bill Callahan for helping Washington notch its first ever win in Miami. Even if it was to what is currently perceived as the worst team in the league. Up next, Patriots Giants. Pats. What the f*** was that? I know they ended up winning 35 to 14, but that score doesn't tell the whole story. The truth is, the Patriots were really trying to give the Giants a shot to have this game. And I must admit, last week, I called the Giants defense wet toilet paper on a graham cracker. Well, they pl really played their asses off in this game. Made me look stupid. And it was a low scoring affair early, if you can imagine. If Big Blue's offense had performed like their defense had, they probably would have won that one. It opened as follows. The Pats' first drive went 53 yards before they turned it over on downs. Then New York went three and out, and then the Pats went three and out, and then Daniel Jones threw an interception, and then Brady threw an interception, then Giants three and out, Pats three and out, Giants three and out, blocked punt, which New England recovered and returned for the first touchdown of the game. It would be too easy to give the what the fuck to the Giants but they were without Saquon Barkley and like two of their starting receivers. And let's not forget, Danny Dimes is still a rookie. And how well do rookie quarterbacks normally do against Bill Belichick's defenses? Exactly. Props to Brady for passing Peyton Manning for the second most pass yards in NFL history, putting him hot on Breezy's ass for that top spot. And with Breezy's sideline for the moment, he proceeds unopposed. Panthers Bucks. Jameis Winston, what the fuck was that? Last week, I called the Panthers winning that game because I felt they'd travel better. But damn, bro, five interceptions? I should be less surprised because let's face it, I don't think anybody has been more prone to turning the ball over than Jameis has in the last few years. But damn, bro, 
even his first pass of the game was a fucking pick. Now, I don't know if they just failed to get the run game going or they just abandoned it all together, but they attempted only 13 rushing plays, like collectively as a team. Yet Jameis threw the ball 54 times. There seems to be a disparity here. So if you guys need a hint as to what the problem might have been, exhibit fucking A. Props to Carolina for a great victory overseas. CMC continues his reign of dominance, becoming the first player in Panthers history with at least one rushing touchdown and one receiving touchdown in back-to-back -back games. Further solidifying my belief that this is his team and Cam should be prepared to go. By the way, Panthers, if you're wondering if it's time to move on from Cam, consider this. What would Belichick do? Eagles Vikings. I don't really have anything to call out on this one. More of a challenge to Kirk. Think you can maintain that level of play? You do that and y'all will be successful. Stefan Diggs went from skipping practice to having a career day. Keep it the f up. Props to the Vikes for the win and Diggs for the day. Texans Chiefs. That was an ugly one for me because Patty Cakes is my fantasy quarterback. And thanks to his down day as well as some down days from others, I lost. But as for who to call out here, it goes back to KC's defense. I mean, they couldn't stop Houston at all. Carlos Hyde recorded his first 100-yard game since week two of 2017. Props. Finally, see what Deshaun looks like with a decent offensive line? Pretty damn incredible, isn't it? Patty Cakes kinda killed me with his fumble, but otherwise it was a pretty exciting game. Props to Houston for the win over this tremendous Kansas City team. Moving on. Saints-Jags, low scoring affair. The Saints became the first team since the 09 Raiders to win two of their first six games while scoring fewer than 15 points. And the Jags became the first team since the 05 Browns to lose two of their first six games while allowing 13 points or fewer. Props to the Saints for the win and Teddy Two Gloves for playing such clean ball. Way to go. Seahawks Browns this is gonna get old pretty damn fast but Browns what the f was that bruh you guys were in position to win this game against a good Seahawks team but then the turnover bug kicked in y'all just couldn't help but give the ball back to Russell Wilson and let him come back to win the game Unfortunately, I can't pinpoint the source of all the fuck-ups in this game, so it goes collectively to all of y'all. However, I will say that in response to the pundits on TV asking who's to blame for the Browns' struggles, first of all, there's enough to go around. But the majority of it lies with the one name none of those talking heads mention for some reason. John fucking Dorsey. Jason Whitlock claimed it's OBJ's fault, and followed that by stating, OBJ should have never been brought out there. To that I ask, did OBJ trade himself to the Browns? Did OBJ trade their second best offensive lineman? Did OBJ promote Freddie Kitchens to head coach? I don't fucking think so. And as far as his behavior, compared to his time in New York, OBJ has been a fucking saint so far. So I wish they'd back the fuck off him a little and at least wait until he does something worth shit talking about. Props to Seattle for beginning their season 3-0 on the road for the first time since 1980. <laughs> Keep it up. And now, a live look at the Cincinnati Bengals. Alright folks, nothing to see here. Move along. It's honestly painful to watch the Bengals. They suck. They know they suck. But it's not for a lack of trying. It's just for whatever reason, they can only seem to score points in random bursts, and then otherwise they look inept. They started out with a TD on the very first possession. And then from there, it was punt, punt, interception, field goal, punt, punt. And finally, another touchdown that brought the final score to 17-23 Baltimore, which dropped the Bengals to 0-6 for the first time since 2008. 
Props to the Ravens for beating this hapless squad, and specifically to Lamar Jackson, who set some history of his own, becoming the first player in NFL history with 150-plus rushing yards and 200-plus passing yards in a single regular season game. Go get him. 49ers Rams. Rams. What the f*** was that? At home. Although you could have fooled me with all those red jerseys and that bitch. I gotta say, it's so funny to me that not one, but two teams moved to LA. And the city's interest in pro football seems to be waning because now the Rams are in a slump. There's no fan base for the Chargers out there. There never has been, so I don't understand why they left sunny San Diego that was actually happy to have them to come out there and compete with a team that is previously located there and therefore likely still had some OG fans in the area. The Chargers look out of place in LA and their play seems to reflect that. As for the Rams, everyone's starting to see what I've been aware of since the 2016 NFL Draft. Goff's ceiling. Not so fun without Gurley in there, is it? It's hard to ask this young man to carry this team because, frankly, he is more trailer than truck. You surround him with good pieces and they can go places, as their Super Bowl trip taught us. But as I said that year, they will go as high as Goff's ceiling, which, without Gurley, is appearing pretty damn low. His 78 pass yards were the fewest for any Rams quarterback who played a full game since TJ Rubley in week 15 of 1993. Eager to see how McVay writes this ship. Props to the Niners for kicking ass and to their coaching staff for having this team well prepared. The Niners start 5-0 for the first time since 1990. Falcons Cardinals. I guess I can't call out the Falcons since I predicted the Cards winning this game, but damn, bro, that Super Bowl slump is real. The hangover is real. Well, they better pop an aspirin and throw back a Bloody Mary and get their asses back in the game, because otherwise, I see head coach Dan Quinn being on his way out by the end of the season. Props to the Cards. Cliff and Kyler are meshing, and fairly soon, I think the whole system's gonna function together, and they might actually be able to do something as soon as next season. Falcons start 1-5 for the first time since 2007. Cowboys Jets. Cowboys, what the fuck was that? Y'all got beat by a winless team. Don't get me wrong. Amari Cooper went down, which sucks because I had him on my fantasy team and he left the game after recording a single catch for three yards. Randall Cobb was already not in the game and so Dak had to work with all the backups. But they had Zeke. Gotta say though, Darnold really is a difference maker. He seems to be for real. Props to the Jets for the victory and giving the Cowboys their first three game slide since 2017. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but props to Adam Gase for hiding his actual playbook until Darnold came back. I guess he figured I'm not gonna let them see my bag of tricks with the third stringer in there. We'll just run the preseason playbook until Sam returns. And wow, dude, night and day difference. Also nice to see them leaving the race for the top pick. Titans Broncos. Titans, what the f*** was that? In the Broncos' first shutout since week 14 of 2017, the Titans' offense was so anemic and ineffective that they actually benched Marcus Mariota in favor of trying Tannehill. Danny was not much better, which indicates that while it may be about time to move on from Mariota, quarterback is far from the only position of need. Their troubles run much deeper. Props to the Broncos for the win. Lord knows Vic Fangio needed that s***. Steelers Chargers. Chargers, what the f*** was that? This is exactly what I was talking about before. There were more Steelers fans in that bitch than there were Chargers fans, and y'all are supposed to be at home. The Steelers are on their third string quarterback, which by the way is hilarious because they also have Paxton Lynch on the roster, but they're more comfortable starting the undrafted rookie. What's that say about Lynch, who by the way didn't clock a single down in that game? My goodness. Props to the Steelers, their fans, Mike Tomlin, Duck Hodges, Y'all are doing good, and I hope it continues. And finally, Lions-Packers. 
This one made me mad because of the fantasy game attached to it. I had Aaron Jones, who fumbled early and then dropped a wide-open touchdown catch. So, as far as the call-out, Aaron Jones! What the f*** was that? Now, I don't know if it was the monster game he had last week or the return of Jamal Williams, but Jones crashed back down to earth, mentally, forcing him to play like shit and invoking Murphy's Law. Whatever can go wrong will. And that seemed to put him in the doghouse because afterwards, Jamal Williams started getting significantly more playing time and he made the most of it. 104 yards on the ground and 32 yards plus a score in the air. He almost had a score on the ground, but he gave himself up at the goal line to run the clock out. So some people were pissed. I also had Green Bay's defense, who failed to stop the Lions for damn near the entire game. And it was only the second time this season that they did not force a single turnover. Still, props to Green Bay, Aaron Rodgers, and Matt LaFleur for the decisive victory. The Packers are now 17-3 and versus the Lions at home. Good work. And now for the picks. So if you've kept track, then you know that I was 9-5 and five in my picks last week. I didn't get all the scoring correct, but I did get the majority of the victors right. I'll take that. So for week six, first up, Chiefs Broncos. Playing in Denver, decent weather. And while Denver is sporting one of the league's tougher defenses, Kansas City still has one of the most premier offenses. And historically, this Kansas City team has bested the Broncos the last few times they've met. The Broncos are on a two-game winning streak, and the Chiefs are on the opposite, so I expect them to want to get their asses in gear for this one. Maybe get a little creative with the play calling. Now, I do hate Thursday night games when I have pivotal fantasy players playing in them, because they are always such toss-up games that will honestly go either direction, but I can't be afraid to support my boy now, so I'm still taking patty cakes in Kansas City to win by one score. Book it. Dolphins Bills, playing in Buffalo. This one's pretty easy. Miami's offense is the hottest of garbage. I'm talking about like somebody flew over a landfill and just napalmed the whole fucking thing. That's the extent to which this offense is hot garbage. They even benched Josh Rosen, possibly signaling that their evaluation of him is complete. Or they maybe don't want him to get the game beaten out of him. Either way, Fitz is starting again and Buffalo's defense is pretty damn good. This is a well-coached Bills team, and they should be feasting at home. I'd actually be quite shocked if they did not beat the Dolphins here. Give me Buffalo by two scores. Book it. jags Bengals in Cincy. Neither one of these teams is particularly great right now, but the Jags are doing just about everything a little better. I will admit, Cincy's offense gets it a pinch easier with the departure of Jalen Ramsey following his trade to the Rams, but the Bengals are still a mess. And I like the Jags offense to rebound in this one, so give me the Jags by a little. Book it. Vikings-Lions in Detroit. Now, I don't know how it is that a team under a defensive-minded head coach can be so heavily tilted towards their offense, but that's the situation the Lions find themselves in. It's not that they can't play defense, and they do have one of the league's best corners in Darius Slay. The problem is the Vikings have more than just one weapon to cover, and provided Kirk Cousins maintains his momentum from last week, they'll be able to score on Detroit. But Detroit may have trouble scoring on them, as Minnesota still sports one of the better, better defenses in the league as well. Give me the Vikings by a field goal. Book it. Raiders-Packers in Green Bay. I like how the Raiders are looking this season. They have a new energy about them. Unfortunately, I like the Packers more. They seem to be firing on all cylinders. So give me the Packers by six. Book it. Rams Falcons in ATL. The Rams are coming off a tough loss and just added a top-notch corner to their defense, although we don't know for sure how much of an impact he'll make at first, even if he plays in this game. But overall, I think the Rams are more talented and the Falcons are still on the downslide. And while a win over a team like the Rams would do wonders for that, it'll still be an uphill climb getting there. So give me the Rams by a touchdown. Book it. Texans Colts in Indy. 
I like the Colts this year. Despite losing Andrew Luck to retirement, they have a well-built team. They're tough, and Jacoby Brissett has been extremely underrated as their quarterback. However, the Texans are hard to stop now that they have decent offensive line play. Behind this revitalized line, Carlos Hyde produced his first 100-yard rushing game in like two years. Deshaun outplayed Patrick Mahomes at Arrowhead. They've just been a completely different team. So give me the Texans by 10. Book it. 49ers Redskins. This one's not even funny. The Redskins notched their first win this season last week, but it was against the Dolphins who are competing for the top pick in the upcoming draft. And they barely beat them. This will probably be a blowout and a wonderful showing for this complete team. So give me the 49ers by a lot. Book it. Cardinals Giants in New York. This one should be fun. Battle of the rookie quarterbacks. First overall versus sixth overall. New York seems to be on track to get Saquon and Evan Ingram back, which would make things much, much easier for Daniel Jones. Cliff and Kyler continue to develop, and they're finding their rhythm, which, if I can just say, is still so cute and heartwarming. As a fan of good stories, you really want this to work out for them because it would feel like this beautiful, dramatic tale that would make for a great movie. I'd watch it. Either way, they're finding their groove, and I remain at the position that as long as the offense produces, that defense will work. That's how it was when Vance Joseph was the defensive coordinator in Miami. It's why he and Gase worked well together, and I believe it's why it'll work in Arizona as well. I felt that way ever since they hired Vance Joseph, because the prevailing question was how can we bring in this glorified offensive coordinator who has a penchant for not paying attention to his defenses as our head coach without having no defense? Simple. You hire a good defensive coordinator who has experience as a head coach, which would also make him a decent interim head coach should you decide you want to move on from your glorified OC. Regardless, the team is trending up, and the defense gets Patrick Peterson back from his PED suspension, so he should be nice and juiced up, ready to go. So give me the cards over the Giants by a touchdown. Book it. Chargers-Titans in Nashville. The Chargers haven't looked good this year. They're 2-4, and four, and all but one of those games have been close. I'm talking one-score games. It's getting about time to hit the panic button for them. On the flip side, it would appear the Marcus Mariota era has come to a close in Tennessee, with Mike Vrabel stating, I just feel now is the time to go with Ryan Tannehill. Tannehill is not terrible. He just needs good coaching, because he's very coachable, and throws one of the prettiest balls I've ever seen. Go watch his throws against Denver, and tell me whose spiral looks like that. I've been under the impression since they made that trade that they were thinking about moving on from Mariota because plain and simply, he's not good enough. He's often injured and just lacks something. And the Titans are well coached, so I expect them to get their groove back against the Chargers, hopefully because they do seem to have some other issues that are bubbling under the surface. But the Chargers seem to be combusting from within, and I don't see those fires being put out in this game. Give me Tennessee by a touchdown. Book it. Saints Bears in Chicago, the Windy City. And word around the campfire is they could possibly be getting Mitch Trubisky back. Is that an improvement? I don't know. You be the judge. He looked good against Washington, but otherwise it's kind of a toss-up between him and his backup, Chase Daniel. But their defense is still no joke. However, the Saints have a pretty complete team, and Teddy Two Gloves seems to really be coming back into his own. He looks like his old self again, and Sean Payton is taking full advantage. The Saints have not missed a beat, and in this clash, although the Bears are favored to win, I think it'll be the Saints prevailing by about a field goal. Book it. Raven Seahawks in Seattle, the 12th man. Although that makes little difference here because the man we know it's really about is Russell Wilson. Russ is playing him some damn ball this year. He's completed 72% of his passes so far, thrown 14 touchdowns to absolutely no picks. He's had a triple-digit QBR in each game this year and has already made some of the most incredible, 
improbable and jaw-dropping passes I've ever seen. He's everything that I'm sure his opponent this week aspires to be. Lamar Jackson started this season hot, benefited from a couple tune-up games to start the season, and he's faced some stiffer competition since then and has come back to earth a little. But make no mistake, he's still completed 65% of his passes and has thrown 11 touchdown passes compared to five interceptions. He's still running hot, and the Ravens' offense is still humming. The weather could be a factor in this one, as the forecast says it's going to be cool and rainy. This may benefit the Ravens, as the game plan for both teams may become a bit more run-centric to account for the weather. The Ravens are currently running the ball better than Seattle, though, as an entire offense. They lead the league in offensive yardage and are second in points scored. Either way, expect this to be a cold, wet slobber knocker in Seattle, with the Ravens prevailing by a slim margin. Book it. Eagles-Cowboys at Jerry World. Coincidentally, the Cowboys have actually won their last three meetings, but there seems to be a lot of uncertainty in Dallas these days. Amari Cooper, Randall Cobb, Tyron Smith, Lyle Collins, Byron Jones, Anthony Brown, and Dorrance Armstrong were all absent from practice on Wednesday, and that does not spell good news for this Dallas team that really needs this win against the Eagles. The Birds, on the other hand, had seven people of their own missing from practice, but five of them were from the defensive side of the ball. But the offensive guys are notable names Deshaun Jackson and Darren Sproles. Their status for the game is in the air. But overall, I think Philly is better equipped for this one despite them playing in Dallas. So give me the Eagles by a touchdown. Book it. Finally, Patriots Jets. I'm going to state for the record, despite New York's recent victory, Darnold or no Darnold, beating the Patriots is going to be a tall task. Arguably, Adam Gase took the Jets' job to stay in the AFC East because he had experience facing the Pats, and I guess that's a good measuring stick of progress. If you can't beat your way out of your own division, you're not ready to take on the playoffs. Although it could just be Gase's egotistical ass wanting to topple the Giant at the top of the hill, or whatever. Whatever it is, I still don't think they're going to do it, at least not this time. I believe the Pats were ready for Gase when he was in Miami. I believe they'll be ready for his ass in New York. Give me the Pats by two scores. Book it. And that's going to do it for us today. If you enjoyed, then please tell somebody. Get them listening too. Check me out on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, at Seriously Savak. The name would have been changed to Seriously Sports as well, but Google is being weird about my YouTube channel. Something about people changing their names too many times or some shit. I don't know. Subscribe for more great content, and until next time, for Seriously Sports, I'm Savak. Thanks for listening.